All right. That's everything. Now let's go to the sermon that I'm more excited to talk about. All right, so uh, we're, in, uh, we're in week three of the series that we're doing on our vision. In the first week, a couple weeks ago, we, we talked about this idea of being a, a set-apart people, a holy remnant people, a remnant community, being a, a minority population. When the, the cultural forces and the spiritual forces of darkness are at play in our world, that we would be a remnant staying true to the way of Jesus in the midst of all of that. And, uh, and that as long as people are here on earth, that there would be a remnant of people right here in this place um, that would, would follow and be set apart for God's purpose. And then last week we talked about this idea... Uh, formation, the, the, the vision we have for formation, and ultimately that it's God's will for your life that you be formed into the image of Christ, and that happens primarily through renewing your mind by spending time with Jesus and letting him set your focus on his grace and his mercy and his hope that you might become people of love, joy, and peace and the other fruit of the Spirit. And so that was kind of our idea behind the vision of formation. And then uh, this, this week, we're talking about our vision behind hospitality and uh, this word hospitality that we use around here. And here's our, here's our vision for hospitality, to create environments where anyone and everyone feel welcome and invited into God's family. To create environments where anyone and everyone feel welcome and invited into God's family. Now, um, I was recently reading a book um, that had a, a section on hospitality, and this story was in there. It's a story of a rabbi who had some pupils, and he was talking to the pupils, and he said, how can you tell when the night is leaving and the, and, and the day and the, and the light is coming back um, into the world? And one of his pupils piped up and said, well, is it when you can look out into the distance and you can see an animal, and you can determine whether or not it's a dog or a sheep. And the rabbi said, no, that's not when you can tell. And he said, okay, uh, another people piped up and said, well, is it when you look out into the distance, and you can see a tree, and you can determine whether that's a fig tree or a peach tree? And the rabbi said, no, that's not it either. And his people said, well, tell us, rabbi, how can we tell that the light is coming back into the world again? And he said, when you can look into the face of another person and you can see your brother and your sister, because until you can do that, it is always going to be the night. And I just love that story because what it says about who we are and what we are called to and, and, and where we will find ourselves is that if we can't look at every single person as someone who is an image bearer of God and is our brother and our sister, then we will likely walk around in the dark most of the time. That we will not be sharing the light and living in the light that is found in Christ. And John Tyson, pastor in New York City, wrote a book called Beautiful Resistance, and he said that hospitality begins with a transformation of identity plus a, uh, an environment of welcome, which equals a new humanity that he calls the church, which I thought was really, really interesting. This idea of transformation of identity is this idea of looking at every single person through the lens of the gospel and seeing a brother and a sister. It is, it is looking at every single person as an image bearer of the most high God. And when you start there and you've already created an environment of welcome, then you have the opportunity to create something beautiful that is the church. But if you, you create environments of welcome and yet you don't look at people when they walk through the door as brother, sister, image bearers of God, no matter what, like, hang-ups they have or difficulties they have or struggles they have, how much money they have, what the color of their skin is, it does not matter. If you don't look at them as an image bearer of the Most High God, you will never accomplish being a legitimate church because that is not hospi hospitality. The word hospitality in the Bible is the Greek word philiozenia, which just means love of the stranger, outsider, or other. It's this really beautiful, beautiful picture of looking at people who we might think of as different and turning them into a neighbor, which reminds me of just a great story of hospitality that probably a lot of us know really well, right? Uh, the Good Samaritan, you guys know this story? Uh, from Jesus, uh, just the, the, the parable he tells of this, 
this uh, Samaritan coming alongside and helping this Jew back to health. The, the crazy thing about that is that is a story that just, it breaks so many molds in first century culture, but even in our own culture, because here are these two people of different ethnicities, of different races, probably with different colored skin, who are absolutely hostile toward one another, and yet one just comes alongside. When they're supposed to hate the other, they come alongside and they love the other back to health and do everything they can to, to love them. And it's this hospitality, right? It reminds me of uh, what, what Paul says to Peter in Galatians chapter 2. When, when the church in Galatia is, uh, is separated by um, ethnicity, there are Jews and Gentiles that are part of this church in Galatia. And, uh, and Peter, uh, there's been some Jews that have come to the Galatians um, to visit, and they're seeing that there are Jews and Gentiles eating at the same table, and they're like, you can't do that. And they even get like Peter to buy into that truth, and then you end up finding that these Jews are then start eating at a separate table from the Gentiles, and, and they, don't, they, don't, they don't commune together. They don't have unity with one another. And Paul says, this is not line up with the gospel. This kind of behavior does not line up with the gospel. The gospel unites us and brings us together. There is no slave. There is no free. There is no male, no female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. This is what the gospel does. And so this is what Paul is doing. And he's speaking about this. And that is remarkable hospitality. He's looking at everyone. We're looking at everyone with a transformed identity. But, but let, me, let me just explain uh, like we could, we could pre I could preach a sermon on how you should open up your house and start a life group and be super hospitable or how you should take meals to people who are hurting and those kinds of things. And all of that's hospitality. And I think that's great. But I think the biggest thing we have to deal with, if we're going to truly be these hospitable people that tr like change and transform people's identity into image bearers of God is, is we're going to have to do a great work of radical humility in our life. And so to do that, I want to take us to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to start at the end of 3, we're going to go into 4, the first part of 4, and we're going to kind of dive in there. We're using Paul as an example today of, of what true humility looks like, all right? So here we go, we're going to read through this, starting at verse 21, it says this, so then no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are in Christ and Christ is in God. All right. So he starts out by saying no more boasting in human leaders because the issue that they're facing in the Corinthian church is that they're boasting about who they receive the gospel from. They're saying, well, I received the gospel from Paul and I received the gospel from Apollos. I received the gospel from Cephas and this is why it's better. And they're, they're, they're pointing out the, 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 the nature of these men and what makes one better than another. And what makes one more of a worthy uh, pastor or leader in the church than another. And he starts by saying, no more of that. Stop that. Don't do that. Because you've been given everything. You have everything. Life? Yeah, you have that. Death? Yeah. Present? Future? You have it all. But you have it all in Christ. It isn't because of Paul. It isn't because of Apollos. It isn't because of Stephen. You have it all because of Christ. So stop all the, all the boasting about who you receive the gospel from. Okay? This is a, this is a really... Uh, we're we're going to get to why this is, it matters in, in chapter 4. It says this in verse 1. It says, this then is how you ought regard us. So he says, this is how you should think of us. You should think of Paul and Apollos and Cephas in this way. As servants of Christ... As those who are entrusted with the mysteries that God has revealed. He says, you should think of us as servants of Christ. God's given us a mystery to reveal. He's told us the truth of the gospel is the scandalous nature of grace. And we're just here to share it. But in sharing it, all we are is a servant. This word servant is the Greek word doulos, which means like low, like as low as you can get like that. So he's saying, he's saying, take us off the pedestal and put us in our rightful place. We're just a servant. And we've just been entrusted with a mystery. That's all we're doing. We're just sharing the gospel with you. And he said in verse 2, Now it is required that those who have been given trust must prove faithful. He's saying, so we've been given this. We have to live in a way that proves that we're faithful. 
It says we have to live in a way that shows that we're being faithful to the gospel in which we've been given, the gospel in which we've received. We still have to live a life worthy of this calling. That's basically what he's saying. And then he said in verse 3, he says, this is, this is fascinating. This is where we're going to get to the, down to the nitty gritty here, okay? He says, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. Now, that's kind of crazy, right? I mean, there are a lot of us that walk around going, I don't really care what you think of me, right? Some of you guys have that, that thought process, like, I don't care what you think, right? That, that's something we can resonate with, but most of us care about what we think of ourselves. We care about ourselves in a, in a different light, but Paul says, I don't... I don't care what your opinion of me is, and I don't care what my opinion of me is. That doesn't matter. It's not important. Now, he goes on, and he says, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. He says, I have a clear conscience. That seems pretty confident, right? He's got some gusto. Like, I, I got a clear conscience. I'm not, I, I, I'm not worried. The thing that they're probably doing in this situation, right, and it doesn't explicitly say it in the text, but probably what's happening is one guy is saying, well, you know, Paul, he's an angry guy. I mean, he's a good preacher, but he's an angry guy. Apollos is far more gentle, right? And so he's being judged. He's being, he, he's, he's being prosecuted essentially for his flaws, for his things that he's trying. He says, I don't care what you think about me. I don't even care what I think about myself. He goes, Although I have made some mistakes, my conscience is clear. I'm good. What gives you that kind of confidence? Well, he keeps going. He says, it's the Lord who judges me. So he's able to stand with confidence because he knows that it's the Lord who's going to judge him. This word judge is the same word often translated as justify. Um, and, and he's saying that the, the Lord determines the verdict, not you and not me. And not, the, the Lord determines the verdict. And he goes on, he says, so therefore judge nothing before the appointed time, but wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. Notice God is always concerned more with the heart than your outward actions. You can call yourself a Christian all day long. You can like, say that all day long, and yet it may not be truly the way that like, your heart is shaped to live. You may not actually like, live with that kind of heart. And then the other aspect is that you can make a lot of mistakes, and yet you can mourn over your sin. Like Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And you'll be shown grace, and you'll be shown mercy, and you'll be comforted because God knows your heart. Now, let me just say this. I do believe that the transformed and renewed heart oftentimes is followed by legitimate action and fruit in your life, right? But it doesn't mean that you're not going to fail. It doesn't mean you're not going to make a mistake and that God still doesn't know what's really in you. If you have a really, really good heart, God knows that. Here's what I love about this. He says, at that time... Each of you will receive the praise from God. You ever thought about that? Like we come and we worship God and we praise God and we sing songs to God. And we, we lift his name high. And yet there's going to be a day where if our heart is good and we're just faithful to the calling which we received and we consider ourselves to be servants, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And he's going to give us our praise when, when we see him face to face if our heart is in that place. In verse 6, he says, Now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us. Now, before I finish this, I just want to say something really quick. Paul says, I am applying, I, I am using myself as an example. And I, I often do that as well. And I just want you guys to know that, okay? Um, what, what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to, he's trying to, he puts this in there. Because he's trying to make sure that people understand. He's using himself as an example, but not as an example of someone who thinks highly of himself. 
And so, he, and so sometimes leaders will do this. We'll give you an example. And a lot of times in my life, I'll give you examples of, of things that I'm doing or things that I see God working in or things that I'm moving in. And that's not for you to go, man, isn't Derek so great? Because that's a waste of your time. <laughs> I am not great. Okay? Um, and then sometimes I'm going to show you how awful I really am by sharing some of the nasty stuff that's going on in my life up here too. And all of it's just to give you an example of what it looks like to be someone who's just trying to follow Jesus the best that they can. It's not, it's not to try and have you elevate me. It's not to, you know, try and get you to leave and think that I'm the worst of all sinners, although I probably am, all right? <laughs> like, it, it's, it's the reality of, like, I'm just trying to give you kind of an example of, of maybe things you could look at or things you could do in your own life. But he says this. He says, so that you may learn from us the meaning and the saying, and do not go beyond what is written. So he's writing all this in a letter, and he's sending it out to the church, and he's saying, like, I want you to just stick to what I've written here. Okay? Stick to what I've written. Don't go beyond what is written. I've just told you that I and Apollos and Cephas were all the same. So... If there's a private conversation that happens, go back to what is written, right? He's saying, don't go beyond this. This is, this is where you go to for direction and guidance. He says, then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against another. The word puffed up or, or the words puffed up is really a Greek word that, that Paul uses six or seven times in Corinthians as well as one other time in Colossians. And it's, it's the word often most used for pride. Um, and what it means is overextended. It means overinflated is, is the idea. Um, and then he says, for who makes you different from anyone else? Who makes you different? Who makes you different? He asks them this question. He wants them to think about it. Is it Paul? Is it Apollos? Is it C who makes you different? Is it one of those guys? He says, what do you have that you didn't receive? Everything you've been given is by the grace of God. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. It was given to you freely. He says, and you, if you didn't receive it, why do you boast as though you did not receive it? So he's saying, stop the boasting. Everything you've been given, you have every, and you have everything. It's all yours in Christ. It's his grace to you. But you received it. You didn't do anything to earn it. And I didn't give it to you. And if, and if I did give it to you, I'm nothing special. So he's, he's trying to draw a line thing, okay? So here's, here's where um, I, I want to I kind of take this, because this is, this is really kind of a, a hard thing to unpack if we don't understand it. But if we're going to talk about boasting and we're going to talk about humility, we have to talk about self-esteem, I think. We have to talk about self-esteem. And you'll notice something uh, truly interesting and, and really powerful about Paul and his kind of character in, in, uh, in this. Our, our culture, our culture uh, back in the early 2000s, many people thought that our culture was making a shift. Uh, thought that our culture was making a shift to the point of like, if you are... Um, if there is a problem in the world, it's due to this issue. And our culture said that the problem uh, with all things in our world stems from low self-esteem. And then a lady wrote an article in 2002 in the New York Times called The Problem with Self-Esteem, and where she had done a study, and they discovered that like, ultimately people in America don't have a problem with too low self-esteem, people in America have too, a problem with too high self-esteem. So it's not actually humility that people in, in America, or what we would call humility, um, is the problem, but what actually is pride. Now, let me just say that that's the traditional view, and it has been for a really long time. You look in the scriptures, that's the view you're going to get. Like, God exalts the humble and humbles the exalted. You see it over and over again. Paul says in Philippians 2, he says, take, like, like, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but instead take on the very nature of a servant, that word doulos again. Become low, just like Christ. Have the mindset of Christ, 
who took on the very nature of a servant. Matthew chapter 10, verse 45. I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. So you see, like, this idea of servanthood and humility and lowliness is valued in the gospel and in the way of Jesus. It's a really, really important thing. And, and throughout the traditional view, most of the issues, most of the wars, most of the uh, genocide, most of the difficult things that we faced as a society and its people on earth came from pride, stemming from pride. But I will say this, in 2007, there was an invention that changed our world forever, it was the iPhone. And on this phone... At any point in time, at any time you want, and some of you for hours a day, you can get on it and you can just look and compare yourself, not to your closest friends and not to your closest, you can literally compare yourself to all of your nearest acquaintances that you've ever met. And you will sit there for hours and you will look and you will compare your life to all of the highlights of every acquaintance you've ever had. And so I won't say that one of the issues of our society is not low self-esteem, because I can see how we maybe are getting there. But either way, whether you have low self-esteem or whether you have too much self-esteem or whether you're prideful, you're empty either way. If you have too low a self-esteem, you're deflated. You're empty. If you have too high a self-esteem, you have too much pride, you're puffed up and you're empty. The problem with pride is that it's also painful and it's also busy. Like think about after you eat way too much and you're overextended, how painful that can be. But you're, when, you're, when you're prideful, you're just puffed up with emptiness, with air. There's no substance there. And so you're just full and overextended of nothingness, of emptiness. And so you're busy trying to fill it. To pad your resume. We're really, really like. Resume building is a big thing in our world. It's a big thing. I was listening to a pastor talk about this recently. And he said. He said, you know, when I was a junior in high school. My mom. She told me I should go out for the chess club. I was like, mom, I hate chess. Why would I ever go out for the chess club? Because it looks good on your college application, honey. And then she goes, well, you should also sign up for a National Honor Society. He goes, I don't want to be a National Honor Society. I want to go to the movies. And she was like, but it'll look good on your college application, honey. And he was like, we're all building a resume. And when you're puffed up and you're overextended, you're trying to build a resume so that people think of you with a high esteem because you think of yourself with high esteem. And so you're overextended, but you're empty, you're painful, and you're busy trying to fill all the emptiness to pad the resume. Now, here's, here's the reality. The truly humble person, which I think Paul is in this case, is someone, if you want to know, like, what does a truly humble person look like? A truly humble person is someone who can uh, not be devastated by criticism, but also not ignore it. If you're devastated by criticism, what happens is you get deflated. You become someone of low self-esteem. And if you're somebody who's prideful, what you'll do to criticism is like, I don't care what you think. You don't know me. Who are you to speak into my life? A truly humble person isn't devastated by criticism and also doesn't dismiss the criticism. They truly become a person who's willing to try and work with what the criticism is. They go, yeah, I could take that and I can use that. It doesn't devastate me that I have to work on myself or that I have things that need to improve or something that, you know, this person sees in me that maybe could be changed. Or, like, that's a truly humble person. Now, Paul, the way he gets there is he says, I don't really care what you think, but I really don't care what I think of me. God is the judge. He says, he says I've come out of the courtroom. He says, I don't care what any human court thinks of me. Which means he's taken himself out of the courtroom. You ever feel like you're on trial? You ever feel like every day as you live life, like there's a prosecution that you have to defend against? You ever feel like sometimes you have to prosecute others? 
and point out all of their shortcomings and their flaws? You ever feel like you're in the courtroom? Paul says, I'm out of the courtroom. I'm getting out of the courtroom. You guys can, you guys can prosecute me all day long. I'm not going to defend myself. My conscience is clear because I have Christ and he judges me. He's the one that justifies me. The word uh, in the Greek, it, it has this term of like verdict. He's determining the verdict of me. And he's already determined the verdict is what Paul said. He's already determined the verdict. He came and he saved me, died on the cross for me. He calls me his son. He calls me, he calls me his beloved son in whom he's well pleased, even despite all of the things I've done wrong. So my conscience is clear because the gospel is mine. And this is how he walked. Do you think that Paul is a guy with low self-esteem? No, he's not. Right? I mean, nobody, nobody that is, I, I don't think, I don't think that there are very many of the top leaders the world has ever seen. And he's probably top 10 who have low self-esteem. But he also isn't prideful. He's not puffed up. He says in 1 Timothy, he says that, that Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the worst. That's what Paul says of himself. He came in and saved the, saved the world. The, he, came, he came in the world to save people like me. And like us. But he saved us. He's redeemed us. He set us free. So we don't have to live deflated. But when we're tempted to get puffed up, let's, let's come back to reality. And realize everything that we've received or everything we have, we've received by His grace. We haven't done anything to earn it. Now, you want to know, how does this play into hospitality, Derek? I mean, I love the idea of humility, but how does this play into hospitality? Like, when do you even get there? Well, here's, here's the thing. If you have too low a view of yourself and you're always deflated, when someone walks in who's truly gifted at something, they walk in the room. You don't want to be around them. You don't want to welcome them in. You don't want to encourage them. Because they make you feel lesser about yourself. And you know, the problem with pride is when someone walks in the room, you're too arrogant and too prideful to give them the time of the day. Because you think that the world rotates around your clock. And so if you can't be a truly humble person, you can't be a truly hospitable person that can welcome anyone and everyone into this place and invite them to be a part of God's family. No matter who they are, no matter how old they are, no matter how wise or stupid they are, they're all image bearers of the Most High. And for us to really, truly transform people's identity into those image bearers and into our brothers and sisters, we have to transform our identity into a son and daughter of Christ and look at ourselves rightly in view of God's mercy as the worst of sinners but who's been saved and set free. Not deflated, but not puffed up, but truly humble truly humble. That's how you can live a life of hospitality. Now you may be wondering, like, why is hospitality so important at Lake Springs Church? Well, because hospitality is what Jesus does when he shows up on the scene. We were the stranger. We were the alien. We were the outsider. And he offers us filiozenia. He offers us hospitality. He saves us. And invites us in. This is how people are one for the gospel. Very rarely, and I'm not, very rarely are you, I think, going to win people for the gospel by going and passing out tracts. Very rarely are you going to stand on the street corner with a bullhorn and tell people they're going to hell, and people respond favorably to that. Why? Because those methods, those methodologies of evangelism are pretty arrogant. They're pretty puffed up. A truly humble person just says, Look, can I just, 
Can I just love you as who you are? Sinner. I want you to be my brother. I want you to be my sister. Can I just love you for who you are? Because Jesus loves you for who you are. That kind of hospitality, it, it wins people for, for Christ. So I can, I can try and teach sermons about how to host a life group or whatever, but I think it would be better for us to just become those kinds of people and live with that kind of hospitality and see what God can do through us. See if God can't win people for the gospel through that remarkably humble hospitality that we show. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. God, thank you for just your loving kindness, your hospitality to us. God, I pray that in view of your hospitality, God, we do not let ourselves become deflated. But we look at ourselves rightly through the lens of the gospel that says we have been saved and we've been set free. That you love us, that you call us your sons and your daughters, who you love and are pleased with. God, I pray also that we will not become puffed up when we have good theology or a lot of knowledge. I pray that we will not become puffed up when we have a breakthrough. I pray that we will not become puffed up when, when we see you do something in our life. I pray that what we do is we, we keep that in perspective and we truly see that it's you who's done something. And all glory and honor and praise is yours. God, you, you, God, have given us everything in Christ. And it is our hope and it is our prayer. Quite literally, Christ is our hope and our prayer that he would, he would in, infiltrate our life in such a way that we could be humble full of his spirit, not empty and overextended, but full of you, full of your spirit, full of your love and joy and peace, that we might be able to share your love with the world, your joy with the world, your peace with the world, shine a light into dark places, because we always see a brother and we always see a sister. God, use that heart and that mentality to reach people for your kingdom. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you guys to the table today. Our communion tables are in the front and in the back of the room. And just want to invite you uh, here in just a second to stand and move to one of those tables. And as you do, just revel in the remarkable, humble hospitality of Christ. That he didn't have to invite us in as the stranger but he did and his love and his mercy his kindness he invites us in to be a part of his family and so may you dwell on that today may you remember that it is by his broken body by his shed blood that we have that we have hope you know the bible says that when when Jesus died and he said it was finished, the veil that separated God from man was torn in two. The dividing wall of hostility was broken down. And so because of, because of his remarkable hospitality, humble, meek, in the heart of a servant, with the heart of a servant, he destroyed the host hostility that stood between us. Through his hospitality, he, he destroyed the hostility between us and God. So let us remember that and take hope in that this morning as we take communion. I invite you to stand and respond whenever you feel led.